Hi everyone, it's nice to see all of you and welcome back to our session. Uh, I'm sorry I got late in for a couple of minutes, so here we are uh, with the third session in um, our startup program here at the American Center uh, Hanoi in Hanoi in, at the American Embassy. And our topic today is going to be the third session of how to craft a perfect pitch. We'll be waiting for a couple of minutes before people get come in and uh, we'll get started right away. So give me a couple of minutes, so get ready. All right. Hello. Uh, hello, it's nice to see you look very familiar. I think I've seen you around before. Hello, Ha Sun Lam. Yeah, good to see you. All right, so from last week, we have been talking about the crafting a perfect pitch. This is our third session and is officially the one before our last session. So we have got, gotten through these kind of content before. Basically, for those who are newcomers in our training sessions, the perfect pitch is important and why we have to be here is because in investment if you are starting your own business it's there is a high chance that you will be asking people for your invest for their investment because not everybody have all the financial capacity to open the uh, to open their business without borrowing or without getting other people's endorsement and in order to get people's endorsement usually you have to do what's called a pitch the pitching whether it is going to be your family or friends or most importantly if you're doing it to strangers to um, financial institutions such as banks investment banks angel investors vc venture capitals um, these kind of people will need to hear from hundreds thousands of different businesses about their business and why they deserve to get the investment and that is fundamentally the action of doing a pitch. A pitch consists of two parts. The first part, which is the real one, I usually call it, is the one that you do a performance. What you say, how you deliver it, the flow, the story you say, that is what's going to be in the real pitch. But at the same time, like the Apple product launching, you will need something behind you, which is kind of like a, um, sorry, um, which is um, a presentation. Whoever, if you are, you know, if you were watching the Apple product presentation about the iPhone 13, that is typically what the pitch is going to look like. The presentation of all the great things that your business, your product is gonna bring and why everybody should jump on the bandwagon. So the general guidelines is the pitch should be about 10 to 20 slides and it should have multi purposes. So if you're meeting an investor on the first day, it should be providing, you know, a good introduction of your pitch. It's okay to have multiple versions, shorter versions, the versions without the financial numbers, the versions with them, those kind of things. And then uh, you will want to have the basic information. So in order to understand more about this, hello everyone. Uh, if you are finding this course helpful, please help us spread the love. This is free training at the American Embassy, American Center. And usually we hold seminars and workshops and training sessions, classes in the American Center. But because of the Corona situation, that's why now we have to see each other from afar like this. I really hope once everything is safe again, we'll see you in person. But in the meantime, please share the video and share the love. Thank you. So coming back to the topic, 
when you are asking for fundraising, there are different tips, tricks, and into pitching, not only how to craft the words that you say, not only how to do the slides, but also understanding the mentality, the dynamics, and how do you get that investment. So usually this is how hand funding works. Uh, you, on, initially, usually we would do bootstrapping. Remember, self-fund is the way. If you are not willing to fund your own money in, nobody is going to fund for you. At the same time, if you fund it, then actually, in my opinion, it gives founders a lot more responsibility. It gives you a lot of heart lessons that you wouldn't get if you get you know great amount of funding initially. Secondly, you go into seeding phase. In the seeding phase, uh, you usually get a, an amount of what's called a seed money. Seed money, like seed, plants, flowers, they are the initial liveliness of a plant. So seeding money is kind of providing the initial money to run the company. It's not going to be enough, but it is the initial amount to kickstart your startup. And that is in the U.S. It's going to be about $500,000 to $2 million, which translates roughly to 10 billion, 11 billion Vietnamese dome to 50 billion Vietnamese dome. But in our cases in Vietnam, the number of course is going to be much smaller. Then you have to learn how to get familiar with the a series A or round A, B, C, D. Basically, it's just one, two, three, four, five, but people like to use alphabet of the times and circles and amount of time that you will do funding. So when you run out of money, uh, you go to round A. When your product's ready, when the startup is ready, go to round A. After you burn enough money or you feel like the company has gained enough traction, enough results, and you want to get more money, you can go to round B and et cetera. You can go to C, D, E. And usually every time the, the letter increases, that is when the amount of money increases. So round A is usually three to six million US dollars. Round B is about that. But don't be greedy. Just because you look at millions of US dollars doesn't mean that the funding is easy. First, it's not easy to convince uh, venture capitalists to get, uh, to get investment. Secondly, not only it's not easy, but you are, that's not your money. You're not supposed to use that money for yourself. You have to use it. And actually, the people, expect, the people who give you money expect you to burn it. Burning means that you have to use all of that money as fast as possible in order to make your company grow equally as fast. If you're burning without delivering the KPI, a lot of times the investors, they can pull out and you are stuck with a very big debt. So you don't want to do that. And then, you know, you go to further round of funding and we talk about, so when, so we talk about startups. So why do people, you know, why do people want to do it? What's the risk? Well, the risk is you can never see IPO. But if you can do IPO, then we have seen, you know, examples of Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, the, their IPOs created a huge amount of cash flow for the founder. We also call it the payday. The payday or the cash out day is when your company finally can be sold in the um, initial public offering at the primitive market, the stock market, where people will buy your stock. And all of your hard work gets repaid on that day. And that's how you become millionaires, billionaires. So that is a story of a successful startup. And all of it usually starts with a good pitch. And that is the reason that we are here today and we are doing training for you startup um, founders and those who are interested who would really like to go enter into this. So remember, we have different versions. These are the notes that you can find in the first and second session. Please go to the US Embassy Facebook page. Under video, you can find my other classes as well as previous lectures. Uh, the common mistakes, we've talked about that. And now we'll talk about how to create these kind of slides. So the pitch deck that I want to, I showed you last time, there are two versions that you can copy if you haven't had the chance to do so. Take a picture of this slide. So this is one of the Guy Kawasaki's 12 slides. Guy Kawasaki is a very famous startup writer, lecturer, mentor. He has been in the startup world and he's been, you know, his books are the go-to material for startup founders. 
and he recommends these 12 slides. These slides include the introduction, who is doing this product, the problem that you are trying to solve, and you and only you can do that because you have these advantages. Your solution in detail is this, and that solution is then translated into this product. The traction, which means the result that you have been uh, you have been gathering, is that, and because of um, because you already proved that the market right now is huge, the potential is huge, and this competition. There are competition in the market, but you are not worried about them because this is your business model. This is how you are going to make the company. So because of all of that, you are asking for this kind of investment. And if they agree to meet you the second time, please see the contact page. It's very simple, very to the point, and it's um, the easiest way for people to understand or to go into that uh, pitching next meeting. But there's also option two. This is the second level. The option two is something that I also prefer. It's very, um, it's, it's very good for normal people. So if you're pitching to families and friends, the, the slide two actually I love better. Also, it's a very sellable. It's always trying to sell the company, sell the idea, sell the concept. So it's very good for people to grasp. Even if you are prof a professional finance uh, financier, a lot of times we are humans. And, and, and in human brains, people like to make stories. We like to fantasize about a perfect world and we like to translate stories into the future, into possibilities. And the storytelling flow usually is going to help you with that. So in the storytelling flow, you can tell it to normal people as well as people outside of your um, industry. So a lot of times you'll be meeting people who are outside of your industry. If you're working in a restaurant, F&B business, you, have, you can meet a lot of people from the banking sector, which are not really familiar with the jargons, the wording, and the business. So storytelling is a better way to make people uh, interested, even though they are not familiar with with you know, what you are, whatever you're doing. So in the storytelling deck flow, what we will go is come in with a nice pitch, an elevator pitch, which is a kind of like a short paragraph or just, you know, two or three sentences that, that makes that hook that is like the, the, the main selling point of your business. Secondly, then show them the proof right away. You don't have to wait until slide six or seven to show proof, momentum. You want to give them all the numbers because numbers impress people. For example, and, and I, by no means am I recommending this. So for example, if, you have, um, if you have, you know, um, let's say 20 people downloading your app, excuse me, and you have 20 people downloading your app. And last month, 40 people downloaded your app. Is, you know, if you put in like, you know, we have attraction of, you know, plus 20, uh, plus 40 people, that it's not very impressive. But if you know how to use numbers, right? And you say, you know, our traction, our downloaded sessions has increased by 200% every month then that actually make, gives people a lot of things to be excited about. And because of that reason, the slide that has numbers, that has you know, impressive uh, traction is going to be your, your hook, your bait. So putting the slide two here is that kind, it has that kind of effect. If you did something well, what is your momentum, expertise, your key numbers, throw them in the slide two. Number three, the market opportunity. The people want to see that the business will be successful maybe in next year, but also in the next five, 10 or 20 years. So you need to give the reader or your audience an overlook of the market and why it is um, a big opportunity and why the world is changing and this is a new way to make money. Please define the market size because nobody wants to use a product or a solution that is only got, only going to be around you know for the next two years. People want to see you know ten years later we're right, still using iPhones. The first iPhone I came out when I was in university, and now we are still you know excited about the new iPhone, the new MacBook. I'm live streaming from my MacBook. At that time, you know we go to Apple keynote speeches just to buy an AirPod. I'm sorry. 
an iPod. And nowadays they have replaced an iPod, but they still keep up with the market and pulling out, uh, pushing out exciting items. So because of that, you know, make sure that you show them that the market is big enough and also show who is your customer. Number four, then present your problem and your solution. What need do you fill? What are the other solutions? Why are you the best to service this market? Then, only then, go into product and services. A lot of people get excited too much about their products. They think their product is everything, but so they don't do the build up. You need to hook your audience slowly and slowly until you show them the product. And then number six is, of course, the business model. The product is not the company. The company is a money-making machine where you need to show people that it's very good at making money. So make sure you show them the revenue stream, how the money is going to flow in, and then show them the strategy. Show them that you are smart, that you know exactly what to do. You just need their support in terms of finances, and that's how you get closer to the financial slide. Before that, you can add the team and key stakeholder so people know who they are working with, the experience level. Of course, if you don't have that much experience, and your team is very small or not very impressive, well, in terms of profile and background, maybe you can skip that. Always mention your competition. Always show why you are better than them or in what kind of you know, unique um, standpoint do you have that can compete with them well. And finally, go to financials and investment. How much are you asking and how are you going to use that? The use is going to be very important. If you're asking the money and just to say you have to do marketing, then they will not give you the money. But if you're doing that for more R&D, for purchasing, for growing the team, then that is very valid as well. So please take a picture of this slide as well. I have made kind of like a menu. These are all the possible slides that you can put in if you, don't, if you want to create your own version. So this is the ingredients list that you can use. There are two pages of that. So there's, these, these are the most common slides. There are 15 of them. Please take a picture. I'll give you a minute. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Have a nice day, too. So carrying on. The cover slide, elevator pitch, we talked about that. So market problem and solution. Please check my second video and then you can you know, see detailed explanation about the slides. But look at the green box. That's how we are going to combine that to create kind of like a recipe for your pitch deck. So we can have a five slide deck, which is a combination of one, two, three, which is cover, elevator pitch, the market opportunity, and what's been done right now, um, your solution and your team. Then you put in the traction and awards. It's very similar to the one above that I just talked about. And then you do 19, 12, and 14, which is the financial projection, how much money you're asking for, and, oh, I'm sorry, the numbers are different. Then, then you can do 10 slides, which is the key slides without the optional ones, which is, you know, the other ones, and then your solution, traction, financial model, yada, yada. And if you want to do a retail, a real, really comprehensive one, the 15 to 30, then use all of these 15 slides and then add the whatever ones that they want you to do. So for example, if you're a tech com company, you can also add your technical solution. If you are selling a product like an iPhone, then you can put in you know, the demo, the pictures, the photos, the videos, all of those things. All right. Now, today we'll finish that with a list of other slides, the ones that is a little bit difficult to comprehend. But if you have these slides, it's going to show that you are a veteran, a very experienced person in the startup and funding business. With that, We'll go through the first time. It's a lifetime value of customer. This is very important in any business, not only in startup. And if you're not familiar with these items, please take a look at them. 
comment in the comment section for me and we'll get to you in the live stream. Please make sure that you uh, have us here and comments right inside the um, comment section. So the lifetime value of a customer talks about a customer. Who are they going to be? Um, how are they going to be spending money on you? So, and for how long, most importantly, uh, as the word lifetime implies. For example, if you are a, let's say an example, if you are a retailer that sells baby stuff, um, let's say, you know, Suck and Brother or Bibo Mart or Kids Plaza. So if, 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 if I'm not mistaken, actually, I've never gone there. So if I'm not mistaken, they carry the products for babies, toddlers, infants since they were born until they are maybe 36 months, three years old or five, four years old. If there are any moms out there, dads out there, please enlighten me. I'm just going to assume that they are carrying products for babies until the age of three. So your customer, which are, if you consider your customers to be babies, which is not true anyways. So let's say that your lifetime um, of, a, of uh, your customer is going to be in three years, right? So that is your lifetime. What is the value? So if you can ask somebody who's a mom, and if you are, and you know that, and you can list out all the spending that you are spending on your baby. So for example, when they are born, you buy them, you know, products like, um, yeah, milk, diaper, medicine, um, skincare products for eczema, uh, supplements, those kind of things. And even beds and cradles and bassinet. Uh, you probably are better at that, at that than me. So those kind of things you can calculate until three years old. When your toddler, so maybe a three-year-old toddler might have different needs that the store also services to, such as supplements, growth supplements, books for children, uh, toys, those kind of things. Then you can add in that each customer can stay with you for three years. Every month, a mother will spend, let's say, $100 to $200 on their toddler baby and infant, which mean that the value that this customer is going to bring to you is about, let's say, $3,000 per year if they keep continue to buy from you. So $3,000 times three years is $9,000. So you can, you can kind of assume that each customer is going to be with you, is going to be with you for, um, you know, three years. Uh, I mean, for three years at $3,000, let's say, you know, let's uh, times three, it's just $9,000. So the lifetime value of a customer is about $9,000. And why is it important? It's important because of the second concept, which is the cost to acquire customer. Cost of acquisition is another cost. And um, this is confidential kind of, but if you are, if you think that, Facebook is free, like we are here. It's actually not free. In order for Facebook to convince you to download their apps, they actually have what's called, you know, cost to acquire customer, CAC, or cost of acquisition. In accounting, we think about this cost a lot. It has to be accounted to the price and the revenue of the product. Because you realize that the customers don't just come randomly. You need to do something. You need to put in an effort to acquire customer. With that, when you do... Um, sales, marketing activities, you are spending money to get a customer. So for example, uh, you are also a baby's, a baby's company, it's infant company, uh, like Vivo Mart, and you are going to organize a marketing event. And this marketing event is a workshop for new moms at the hospital, for example, at VinMec. So what you are going to do is you are going to have to pay money for the production, for the design works, for the running of the event. So let's say usually these kind of events, you are going to be introduced to 30 moms. You probably will have to hire a coffee shop near VinMec, let's say that, and the coffee shop charges you um, 100,000 dong for each customer and you have 30 customers. So which is the venue they would charge you 3 million Vietnamese dong. 
With that, you need to do some printing and designing work. That's also going to be you know, two more million. So you have five million. And then you have to do, do, you know, you have to invite doctors to come there to consult. You're doing something fun for the moms. You're also giving them gifts and present for, you know, maybe early baby showers. So basically you spend uh, 23 million Vietnamese dong, which is $1,000. And after that event, out of those 30 people, 10 people became your customers. They come to your a store and they start buying from you. So, which means that you spend um, $1,000, 23 million, in order to acquire 10 customers. That means that the cost for each customer is 1,000, 10, is $100. There you have it. It's very simplistic. It's not very realistic, but that is basically the rough number for the cost to acquire a customer. So the confidential information is, you know, the banks, the same thing. When a bank have you open your first debit card or your credit card, actually they have a cost for acquiring each card holder. So even if, and usually how long do you stay with, or with a bank? In my, in my opinion, I usually stay with a bank for at least about two or three years. I don't like switching banks. But for example, if you stay with a bank for you know, one year and they, their acquisition cost is about 1 million Vietnamese down per customer. So you can see that actually the cost for acquisition in the banking system is the same as in that example I have about the marketing for baby stuff, but the lifetime value is different. So as VCs, venture capitalists, um, they look at these numbers, they actually in their head, they're thinking whether they should be investing to you based on the cost of acquisition and lifetime value. So that slide is going to be VCs favorite because of that reason. It gives them the idea about whether they should be investing and whether it's you are more your business model is more profitable. Okay. So number two is uh, history, timeline, milestones prior to investment. That is the one we talk about, key figures. Is it, um, you know, what, what is your company's history? What's your story? What is your milestone? The first 100 clients, the first 1,000 clients, the first demo product in the market, those kind of things. And a detailed value proposition is the second slide. With detailed value proposition, we want to see what value you are you providing to the customer. A lot of people want to talk about the product, but the customer does not. So for example, if you want to talk about product, let's say, you know, we at American Embassy, we are having the American Center. Even though we are not selling it, it's, our, our training programs are for free, but we still need to spend money, efforts to promote and to let a lot of people know about, the, uh, know about our program. So if we say that, you know, we have the training programs where this is the modules and it's, you know, two hours every week, you are going to probably leave. You're going to be bored to death. But if we say that this is the value we provide, we want to create an authentic um, American experience in education for the mass majority of Vietnamese people who want to better themselves for free with topics and with content that is um, not available in their language. We want them to have this access to this, all this kind of information and knowledge for free and have this authentic American experience when it comes to learning to better yourself, then that is probably something that you would be interested in. You think to yourself, well, I, I do want to better myself. Uh, that's the first thing. And I want to better myself through training, through learning, through reading. And if this program is for free and I'm interested in the American way of learning, then this, is, this program is for me. So we're not trying to sell you something, but in order to make you be here with me today, we want to give people something to be excited about, something that they can understand that it's for their benefit and it's not for our profit. And because of that, don't talk about the product. Don't say you're selling a phone. The people who sell iPhones, they talk about the values, want to take better pictures. You want to connect with your friends better. You want to have a powerful performing machine that can handle multitask and, and different type of uh, functions like a computer. You want 
value. You don't want the product. So please, 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 if you are talking so much about your product in your company, don't. Talk about the value. And because of that, give the value proposition. If you're also giving the value proposition to your partner, for example, you're asking people to co-join you or to invest in you, give them the value. Don't just, you know, just say that this is a great product, you should invest. Instead, say what this can bring to the partner. It can bring the partner the opportunity to venture into a deal. So for example, a lot of times, you know, people can, I ask people, why do you want me to invest? And uh, I am not familiar with your business, with this business, uh, with the baby stuff business, for example. Then maybe they can say, that is why we bring it to you because you in your portfolio do not have the investment in our business. It's one of the you know, fastest growing business. Our population is booming and you have no investment. So we want to give this opportunity for you um, to jump in the one of the you know, fa fastest growing business there is instead of staying with the old traditional business models. And then that would make me think, that would make me realize that, yeah, we don't have that. Should we diversify our portfolio? Those kind of things. So with that, remember, value, value, value. We are always trying to convince customers, partners, potential strategic partners with value. And thirdly, of course, you know, if you want to talk about it, you have to show them. So show them the demo. If you have the demo of the product, the solution, the app, show them. Then you can have the average, I'm sorry, the average value, uh, average revenue per user. As I mentioned above, it's quite similar and it's related to the slide number zero, which is the lifetime value of the customer. The average revenue of an user is about how much you can make from a standard user. So for example, it's very easy in case of the baby stuff, you can calculate how much a regular family, a mom can spend on her baby on average, and then you can create, you know, an average number that each user is going to spend, you know, maybe $1,000 per year on your product. And of course, it's called ARPU, super important slide. Uh, number five is the pipeline of potential clients. So of course, you want to show that, you know, not only is your product good, the slides is very important because you show that, you know, even without their support and investment, you are doing great sales because if they are investing, they want to know that you are capable of making money. They are just giving you money in order for you to sell more, sell better. So you want to show them the pipeline, so the sales pipeline, what's happening with your sales, who are you contacting you, what are your, who are your clients, who are your future clients, um, and your plan for sales. The percentage likelihood of closing, which means that, for example, if I am selling, let's say I am selling um, a CRM software. Well, CRM software, for those who don't know, is a customer relationship management software. So usually if you're a store, a shop, uh, you usually use that, a company, we want to keep track of all of your customers and we want to take care of them. That's why it's called customer relationship management. Uh, so if you, I'm selling a CRM and I show them that this is my potential clients, who are they? Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, uh, EVN, FPT, for example, for Vietnamese companies. And I show them that the likelihood of, of closing the sales, which means of succeeding in getting the sales is um, 80%. And these are the big names and my clients are very well known. Then the investor would be very interested. Oh, so you're talking to FPT. Uh, have they planned to buy your products? Yes. Why are you so confident? Well, we have pitched to them the product and they're right now in the demonstration period where they're testing out the demo. And we got um, feedback from them that they will be signing the contract with us next month. If you can show that kind of traction, that kind of result, it's much easier for people to uh, invest for you. And then uh, the revenue from potential, then they will ask, how much money are you planning to make from them? Then you can say, FPT is willing to buy the CRM program for 1,000 of its workers, salespeople, and it's $10 per each account. So it's going to be $10,000 from FPT, for example. That's how you, that's a conversation that usually you will have with the people who are evaluating your investment ask. So 
detail, the detailed financial breakdown is uh, you putting in the finance numbers and by revenue, by type. So what type of revenue is that? Is that from an individual worker, uh, an individual client, a downloader, a user, or is it gonna be from an enterprise like FPT, like EVN, for example? And then by expense, if you're gonna have expenses, how much are you spending on IT? How much are you spending on R&D, on human resource, things like that. And the cash runway, number of months, and what burning rate is what we talked about before. The break-even analysis is also a super important slide. In the break-even analysis, we want to show them that our company is not just a money burning machine. We are asking them to give us money to burn, but we know exactly when it's going to come from the you know, negative numbers into positive. When are we going to make our profit? When they can cash out? When is the company going to be successful financially? And um, a funny thing, did you know that Amazon for 20 years, I'm not sure, I haven't updated lately, but for 20 years, uh, until the last time I checked, they have never broken even. They have never made profit. And people go crazy because they think, why? Why are you, wh how can the, what, you know, the biggest retailer in the world, one of the biggest companies in the world, and Jeff Bezos, the um, owner of Amazon, the, the founder, the CEO of Amazon, is the richest man alive in the whole planet, on the whole earth. How come they never broke it even? Because he is constantly putting his profit into reinvesting in the company because it's still growing. It's not because they are not capable of making money and of, of making profit, but because by that, they also avoid a lot of taxes, which is you know another story. But at the same time, it shows that they, are, they keep burning the money because they, they still have room for development and room for growth. So um, then we have the headcount organization structure. This is a little bit boring. And a lot of times the VCs just look at it and then we're gonna be like, you know, next, next, next. But it shows us if you are an experienced manager, if you have the capacity to run the company, if you know about human resource, if you understand management, if you know how to manage people, if you're experienced in that. So that is gonna be our head, head count and organization structure. Um, the partnership agreement here, we, want, we also want to hear, so if we are really interested and we really want to invest, then we would want to know who's involved, what kind of partnership you are doing, so in, even in your founders team, how many people are there, what is the structure, are they um, also co-founders, how much stock do they have, those kind of things, capital structure, same thing, number of founders, blah, blah. So I love me personally. I think the most important slide for me, I don't care about any, to be honest, I don't care about the other stuff. Uh, you can be inexperienced with finance. You can be inexperienced with other stuff, but your strategy and your go-to-market strategy is going to be the most important slide that I look for. Because out of, I, I, I can tell you that out of, you know, um, 100 proposals, pitch decks, or pitches that I've heard or read, uh, then at least, at least 80% of them do not have a slide, go to market strategy. Uh, and it's for some very silly reason. A lot of founders, they don't want to share. They just think that their strategy is very secretive. And, uh, and I understand that point of view. However, what I really think is, you know, ideas and strategies are very cheap. Execution, is more important. A lot of people have the same ideas. Uber, Grab, they have the same ideas. Your friend who opened a restaurant has the same idea with you in opening a restaurant. A lot of people go on Shopee nowadays and sell Chinese imported product from Taobao and from Alibaba. And what happens is people share the same ideas all the time. If you're smart to a certain level, your ideas is going to be smart to a certain level. But it doesn't mean that your idea is unique. But the difference between a successful company and an unsuccessful one is just the execution. Who can do it better, faster, cheaper, and more accurately? And so if you're asking somebody for money and you think that the go-to-market go strategy is a secret, of course, you can have some really great ideas about it. 
But in my opinion, sharing them is more profitable for you because then the, you know you can get people excited. Whereas when you don't share them, it just shows that you don't have an idea about how to bring it to the market. If you have problems with financing, venture capitalists and investors can help. If you have problem with marketing, hiring a good consultancy is good, is easy. But if you don't have a strategy to bring your product to the market, if you don't know how you are going to approach clients, then you're not profitable. Then you are not potential. Then you're just kind of, you know, a silly person with a good idea. So make sure you show the investor your strategy and uh, that will set you apart from all the other people. And lastly, you can have other slides. Uh, in my case, I like a lot of architecture slide. Architecture, there are different kind of models. You have the brand architecture, the company architecture, the technical architecture, uh, technical documents, use cases. You can have uh, the funnel system, so which is the pipeline or sales funnel, marketing funnel, those kind of cool MBA phrases. That's fine too. Operation, business operation. How are you going to operate? How many departments do you plan to have? Those kind of things. And lastly, the growth strategy. How do you plan to grow your business? Those kind of things. So these are going to be a more advanced a set of slides. If you have, you know, uh, if you have a startup that and you are a little bit inexperienced, you just want to do your homework, you just want to tell a good story. This is your first meeting with a venture capitalist, uh, investment bank. And maybe if the person you're pitching to is your family, your friends, you know, the, these kind of slides are enough, you know, elevator pitch, market problem, solution, that's quite enough. But if you are meeting the professionals, if you're meeting the sharks, you know, if you're going to Shark Tank, that's going to be enough. But if you really are meeting the sharks in real life, you probably should know the second sets of slides and of information. And as you can see, there, it's going to answer more in-depth questions, the more cold-hearted questions about money, profitability, and all of that. So with that, uh, let's go to the examples. So let's go to today. I have brought to you the different examples of elevator pitches of big companies. Give me one second. Oh no, where is it? Oopsie. Yes, here it is. Okay, let me share the screen. You share. Where are you? Mm -hmm. So, this is the example that I'm going to show you today. So, talking about it, you know, rhetorics, theoretical is very easy. Oops, sorry. So here is the elevator page of Airbnb. Please mind that I am showing you the more updated version that has been redesigned because it's very pretty. But if you look at the Airbnb um, pitch deck from 10 years ago, it looks very simplistic and it looks very ugly. Uh, PowerPoint at that time was not a you know, design world and PowerPoint wasn't so popular, I guess. So their slide decks, is, it looks quite silly, but um, the content is kept the same. And nowadays it, it really helps to have a nice slide. Um, if you can have somebody professionally design it for you, that's great. It's gonna increase your the attendance, the attention that people really wanna pay for your slide. So. This is Airbnb. Uh, does anybody in the in the live stream do you guys know about Airbnb? Are you running an Airbnb business or have you stayed in an every have you used the service of Airbnb before? If you have, please you know comments that I can know. Oh, thank you, Doling. That's very that's very kind of you. And thank you, Dinduk. I think thank you very much for your support. So please, if you have stayed and rented or if you have worked with Airbnb or familiar with their business model, please comment in the slide. Now we are going through 
their pitch deck for, for the example. So as you can see, even, you know, these are extremely successful businesses, but their, but their initial slides are very simple. So let's see. So you can see this is the cover page. Airbnb, pitch deck, uh, book rooms with locals, rather than hotels. That is kind of like their you know, slogan, short elevator pitch, which means that it, it shows to people what business they are in. Um, the Airbnb business is in booking rooms, in accommodation, and they provide a different solution where you can book rooms with locals than hotels. It provides an alternative to hotel booking. And as you can see, up front, without you know, any fluffy stuff, they go into the problem. The problem is the price is an important concern for customer booking travel online. Yeah, you think about that. It makes you think, doesn't it? Which is true. And I, I if you are, you know, a billionaire that owns, you know, a bunch of hotels and you, pri you fly private jets, then you're probably not going to think about that. But people who travel for what? You know, they travel for fun, for vacation, and the people who travel even for work, one of the biggest costs of it is going to be accommodation. So the price is going to be an important concern for them. And that is the first thing that, you know, in my head, it, it also rings for me. And I think about, yeah, sure, that's true. The second thing is hotel leave you disconnected from the city and the culture. And that really got me as well. Uh, so the other day, you know, I, I, I travel a lot for my work. And a lot of my friends say, oh, I'm so jealous. You can go to a lot of places. Uh, but actually, it's very depressing. I remember, you know, when I was in Hong Kong, for example, I spent, you know, three days in Hong Kong last year. I don't know, not last year, the year before that, before COVID uh bc so um i went to hong kong and i literally you know landed at the airport i went to the hotel for five minutes and then i go to the um, partner's office i stayed there for you know two days and i slept in my hotel room once and then i came i, I go back to the airport and in my in my passport it still says i traveled to hong kong but i never got to eat you know their hong kong toast their dim sum and go shopping and things like that didn't happen. I went to Korea the same way. When I go to Korea, people say, oh, you must go to Korea a lot. It's like, yeah, I do. But I've been there for one day and then I didn't even get the, to eat the food. Um, the other time I went to, um, where else? I went to Bangkok. Uh, you know, Bangkok is very famous for the partying scene and things like that. And I go there. Um, and I go to the factory in some very small province. I was at the factory for three days and then fly back to Hanoi. So these kind of experience for me is very, is very depressing when you go to a certain place and you don't get to feel um, the culture, you don't get to travel and just to feel the people and everything. And the hotels leave you, and the hotels are expensive. You are locked in a very small room. It's usually just about 15 to 20 meters. And it's disconnect, it's a lot of disconnection, which is true. And the last thing is not easy way exists to book a room with a local or become a host. So a lot of times, you know, uh, when we travel for fun, let's say that we really, really want to be living with the locals. They know where to eat, where to go, and what's really good about their city. What is the soul of their country or city or the culture? So when they bring out these kind of three points, they have already determined that their customer, their focus customer, their target customers, both for work and for you know, leisure or for fun, are gonna have these three biggest problems. And it makes people think the price, the fun, and um, the easiness, the convenience. So with that, they provide the solution right away. So this is our solution. We understand you. We understand your problem. A web platform where users can rent out their space to host travelers to. So here they're talking about from the host perspective. So Airbnb, they work in a kind of what we call in the business model called double-sided market. A double-sided market, which means is that you have to serve two opposite people. So, um, who are gonna come together like a matchmaking business. So for example, 
Uber is also in a double-sided market where they have to serve their drivers. Their drivers are also their clients. They have to do marketing to drivers, recruit the drivers, customer service to drivers. They have to make sure that the drivers download their app and start driving for Uber. They also have to service to the end customer, which is us, the people who book the cars. So basically, they have two sets of customers, double-sided market. So in this case, the solution is the first thing here, they're talking about one side of the market. We provide a web platform where users can rent out their space to host travelers to. So first they talk the same way with Uber. They always talk about the provider first. Why? Because you need to have a host first before you have the client. Also, it's easier to talk about the host because it's a money-making scheme. It's very easy to convince people to download your app if you're telling them that you can make money. So it saves money to what? Now you're talking about the client, the end user. You can save money when you travel. You can make money when hosting and you can share culture so for both of the sides. So it sounds very attractive already with the solution. Now, they, they, after all of this romantic talk, they focus on the money. What is the market validation? So they show that in Craigslist, so I'm not even sure if Craigslist still exists in the US, but at that time, you know, Craigslist was kind of like Zawa Chambian, I think it's very similar, um, where people just come up there and they try to connect between people and people. I still remember my first camera that I bought, my first professional camera, I'm a photographer as well, and my first camera was bought through Craigslist. The reason why I use Craigslist for electronics is that you can meet the person and check the product, you know, instead of buying it on Amazon or eBay. So Craigslist is kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer service where people can go there and find anything. You can find a babysitter, you can post for a job, you can sell cameras, sell old clothes, you can find rentals, things like that. So Craigslist has a total value of six over 600,000 total users. Couch surfing at that time was also a platform where you can find you know, accommodation to stay with a local host, a stranger, for about 17,000 um, temporary housing listing. So what they want to show is that right now there is a market. We don't have to go out and look for people with the need to rent out their space because we already know there are 17,000 people out there who are interested in renting their apartment, their couch. And so in San Francisco and New York from this time, and that's only in two places, which is San Francisco and New York. So imagine, you know, in 50 states in the US, how many places, you know, there are. The reason why they put San Francisco and New York City is probably because those are one of the most expensive neighborhoods in the US. So the market size is what? Two billion trips are booked worldwide. That is the total market. So remember, TAM is gonna be a word that we will see a lot. The total available market is kind of like you're looking at a cake, you know, at a birthday cake. And this is the total cake. That's how much that you have you can eat. Um, however, of course, we cannot eat the whole cake, we cannot digest the whole cake, so we would have serviceable available market. Um, and so we know that, you know, we, we are not for everyone, not the, to, oh, bleh, sorry, not the, the total of 2 billion people are available for us. Not all of them will be interested in us because a lot of companies, for example, they book through their agency. They cannot use Airbnb because, for example, in my case, Airbnb doesn't provide the VAT invoice. And if I'm traveling for work, then I will need the VAT invoice to show my accountant. So because of that reason, I will probably have to use, you know, um, agency, booking travel agencies in order to get that invoice. So we can only service about, you know, 25% of a quarter of that. So we have 560 million budget and online serviceable market. So no offline booking, no travel agency, just online. And then those is, are still, you know, this is half the piece of a cake. That's still too much for us. And we just want to be humble and we want to say that we can only digest 84 million, which is also a quarter of a quarter of the total available market. So, oh, it's not a quarter, I'm sorry. That's gonna be, I've got a yeah, math major. Let's see, 84, I'm probably the dumbest math major there is. 
50, 15%, that's 15% of 25% uh, of the total available market. So the trips with Airbnb they want to have is they want to convert 84 million people who are right now working in, you know, budget online services in order to, to uh, book with them. And that is the 15% of the available market. That is their idea. And this is the product that they want to show. So they want to show this is a demo that I talked about. They are showing the search by city. So you can see the product and imagine how it works. So, you know, you can go anywhere, anytime. It's a one guest, um, things like that. So you can imagine, you can find places in Los Angeles, anytime, one guest, the homes. As you can see here, you can go to, uh, you can book for your room type. So you wanna get, you know, hotel rooms, whatever. You can put book by home. So you wanna have a house or an apartment. You can get a price range of how much money are you willing to spend, um, things like that. And you can find different kind of stay, and then it's very easy to book. As you can see here, the cost is gonna be much, much cheaper than actually booking through a hotel. So with this, their business model is, they take 10% commission on each transaction, which means that, for example, here, they are booking, they are booking I'm sorry, um, $375 per night, which roughly translates to 8 million Vietnamese dong. So for 8 million Vietnamese dong, that you can stay at a Malibu by the sea beachfront apartment. Remember that Malibu is a very expensive neighborhood and it is a beachfront. You can see the beach from the window and the, you can see the size is very large. Um, in Vietnam, we have Six Sense Ninh Vân Bay. Six Sense, uh, whose chairman also uh, I'm familiar with is one of the you know, five-star, six-star resorts in Vietnam. It's in Gondau Island. And I remember that when they first came out, their cost for a room is about $1,000 per night. And that's one of the cheaper rooms. Also, you know, it's, it's a, a bungalow. I think it's a bungalow in beachfront in Gondau. And it was $1,000 per night. Whereas here you have $375 per night for a beachfront Malibu apartment. So as you can see and compare the prices, people can definitely see that this is a very you know, cost efficient kind of accommodation and stay. So with that, their business model is um, because they take 10% of the commission and um, they get 15% of the market, which is $84 million. And so for $80 per night for three nights, then they will get about $25 per average fee. And if you multiply that, you probably will have about $200 million projected revenue in 2011. So they estimated that they will make the revenue of $200 million. And uh, market adoption is a little bit like go-to-market strategy. What is your creative way in order to get into the market. So here by events, your target events monthly, they will go to Oktoberfest because when is the high season for travel? Um, vacations is usually around public holidays or some special cultural events. So in this case, they have Oktoberfest, maybe this is in Germany. So 6 million people will probably go to Germany to enjoy Oktoberfest, which is a beer fest. It's so much fun. Um, yeah, it's just constant drinking. <laughs> and there, no, there's a lot of other stuff about Oktoberfest, a lot of culture, fun, good beer, good food, things like that. And a lot of people want to travel at that time. So you have Euro Cup. Euro Cup, you know, I personally, I think, I think it's not called Euro Cup. I think it's called Champions League now. Um, you know, I don't like soccer. I have to say I abhor soccer. I'm sorry to guys out there, but I'm sure that there are many of you who really want to go to Europe to watch, you know, Champions League and things like that. So um, they estimated there are about 3 million people traveling and we've got Summerfest, Mardi Gras, also another great cultural holiday. And so with each of those things, they, they want to do market adoption. They want people to start, you know, using Airbnb for the first time. If I was traveling to New York, I, I at that time, if Airbnb was around, I would definitely try it. Too bad I couldn't. So I got like a 300 or $400 per night uh, room that is, you know, dirty, gross, icky with, uh, you know, 
uh, yeah, it was a very, very bad experience <laughs> in New York, New York City, and um, it was too expensive. So I think if, if Airbnb was around when I was traveling to these kind of events, then I would definitely book them. Another one is, you know, partnership. So they want to do partnership with uh, cheap alternative travel to Kayak. If you don't know about Kayak or Orbitz or Goloco, those are websites where you can book your travel tickets online. Kayak is for flight and accommodation, Orbitz the same way. Um, why do these people, they are not competitors. Well, are they are competitors. Why are they wanting to partner up? It's the same thing with Grab Taxi in the beginning. So these companies, they are used to booking hotels, but this, this business model is, is creating something brand new, which is a local stay. So instead of fighting with each other, they find a way to partner up. And that is why they wanted to partner with Kaya. And of course, Craigslist. Craigslist is the original place where people were posting, but now I don't think Airbnb has to partner with any of these guys because they're already very big. So the competition in the market right now, this is what we call a market positioning map. This for people who are in marketing will be very familiar with this thing. It's a graph where we have a two axis where the vertical axis is about the affordability. So there, it's very affordable on the top, and then you've got the expensive in the bottom. And in the horizontal axis, we've got the offline transaction and online transaction. So as you can see, Airbnb is in the affordable online transaction. So in terms of kayak, kayak is going to be hotel, so it's going to be online, but expensive transaction. Whereas, you know, Craigslist is affordable and online, but less reliable. So you want to put your competitor in the map so you can compare to other people. How do you perform with them based on those two ideas? Does it have to be just, you know, price and what is the other one? And offline online? No. Whatever that's important in your business, just pick two criteria and put them into that axis, okay? So the competitive advantage is what? So Airbnb is the first to market. I, we, are, we have the rule of the first. If you know about that, it means that whoever is the first is usually the most popular one, it's usually wins. So the first to market for transaction-based temporary, temporary housing sites. So they're the first one. That is their first advantage. The second one is so easy to use. It's so, because most people will value convenience. So they are easy to use. Second, third thing is most other sites don't have profiles. The same way as when Uber came out. If you're driving a taxi, if you're driving with a taxi company, it's very difficult to rate them. You have a bad experience with the driver, you will never meet him again. It's very difficult to know if you've got a good driver or a bad driver, if he's got a bad attitude or not. But with this, they have profiles, which means that you can rate your host, if they are rude to you, if the accommodation was bad, at the same time, you can do the, the um, reverse, then you can also rate the user, this, the, the person who's staying there. Oh, that person didn't clean up when they leave, they are not a good traveler at all, they were, you know, they didn't pay in full, those kind of things. So it gives people more security when they're doing these kind of transactions. Then it's uh, you listing once, the host will post only one time, whereas in Craigslist, you, you keep having to post again and again. So it's very inconvenient and takes too much work. So with Airbnb, you have design and brand, which is memorable. It will launch at the historic DNC. That's so funny. Why DNC? Where? And the last one is the host can make money over couch surfing. So with couch surfing, you don't really make money but with Airbnb, you can make money. So in Vietnam right now, young people nowadays, so many people are renting apartments because you know, oh, in Vietnam or in Asia in general, uh, we have this tradition that you wanna hoard wealth. Different from the Western world, um, you know, we are quite similar to the Western world when we talk about Europeans, but Americans are not like this. A lot of times Americans, they rather buy other kind of assets and the regular Americans usually mortgage their homes and um, they spend more than they earn. That is the uh, way of living. But in Asian countries, people like to save money. People like to put them into land and real estate, apartments and housing. So that is what they usually do. And because of that, a lot of 
people who have extra housing are the people who are a little bit older. They're not so fast with, you know, different business models or even renting or managing the rent very well. So nowadays, there are a lot of young people who jump in this business, who go and find these kind of available apartments. So Vin Homes is very popular nowadays for uh, Airbnb. So a lot of people buy Vin Homes just because they have the cash and they don't know what to do with it. Finding um, people to rent out, to sublet, it's very difficult for middle age and up people. So a lot of young people in their 20s are coming in and they're renting those apartments, they're redecorating and they're putting it on listing in Amazon. I'm sorry, in Airbnb. So the team here, we have uh, Joe, we have Brian and Nathan. So we have the user interface and PR. As you can see, the most important thing here is a user interface, the product, because they were saying their competitive advantage is being easy. The second person is Brian Chesky, which is the business development and branding. So as you can see, they need to have traction, partners they need to meet Kayak, they need to work with, you know, Oktoberfest. So business development and sales is something gonna, that is, you know, crucial to the success of this business model. And the third person is um, the developer who is, you know, tech guy. So they, he created the Facebook apps, Your Neighbors. He worked, uh, he is a computer science that graduated from Harvard and he worked at you know, Microsoft and big names. This is what I mean by if your team is impressive, put it on the slide. If they're less impressive, then you know, uh, you can skip that. But usually people like to see who's behind the idea. Okay. And then in the press, this is just extra slides you can see. Um, they have different, they went on Mashable, um, which is you know a popular publications for young people. But Josh Spear and Webfair, not so much popular. So you remember this is, was you know 15 years ago or something. And then they show the user testimonials and now they come to the place where they ask for financials. So here they are looking for 12 months financing to reach, so here it's very clear. They need financing and they tell you that they need, they need financing for 12 months where they will be spending the money. And they need to reach 80,000 transaction of Airbnb. I'm sorry, at that time it was called Air Bed and Breakfast. And in Angel Round, they have already gotten 500K, $500,000, as I told you. And now they're asking for 80 million trips. And I'm sorry, at that time, they were asking for $500,000 in order to get 80,000 trips and in order to make $2 million. And then that is the end of Airbnb. So I'm just going to show you the Uber slide really quickly because we are running out of time, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we have just about five more minutes. So as I go through the Uber, um, as a second example, if you can, please drop me a comment of encouragement and also just send me tons of questions that you have about you know pitching. This is my third lecture and we'll have the last one next week, the same time, where we'll talk about details, you know, each slide and example and what to do. But this is going to be, you know, the heart of the pitching. So look, please, questions as much as you can. So the Uber cab, here you can see the Uber cab is next generation car service. This is also their uh, pitch deck where they do the elevator pitch that says the next generation car service is about, you know, we are car service and we are, you know, 4.0, we're doing something new. Okay, I'm still checking um, comments, but you guys are being awfully quiet. Anyways, they start with the problem. The problem here is cabs in 2008. Most use aging and inefficient technology. So they are, you know, it's very Uber-like. If you know Uber as a company and you've read up on them, they like to trash talk a lot. They like to say negative things about other people. So here, it, Uber says that it's the most inefficient technology with, with cabs, cabs meaning taxi. So radio dispatch, which is, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, the, the walkie talkie, no two-way information because you cannot talk back, you know, you cannot be like on the phone. And most common car is a Ford Crown Victoria, which is a very, very old car. You can see the Myling Taxi, they have the same problem. 
So hailing, hailing means calling a taxi, is done by hand. So you go on the street and then you use your hand or you call to the dispatch and you say, I need, you know, a miling taxi, you know, 323, 66 something, and you need a taxi. And there is absolutely no GPS, which means that if your driver wants to find you, he has to look for the person who says, hey, I'm here. The same thing goes for the, for the user. You have to check which car that is and you don't even know the license plate. Secondly, there is a significant fare seeking or dead time. So that's why you have to drive around and try to find your customer. And, and there are a lot of cases where you cannot find the customer. So they, they just, which, what they said, it was true, completely true. Um, the cab, a taxi business model is so old. Um, and it's not really efficient in the 21st century. And because of that, the problem is the taxi monopolies. So before Grab Taxi comes into Vietnam, remember, Myling was angry, Thanh Nga was angry, um, taxi group, Sun, um, Sun Taxi in, in Saigon, uh, the taxi monopolies reduce the quality of service. The reason is there are only a few available options and the customers cannot choose. You only have those kind of uh, people to service you, brands to service you. And because of that, we don't have much choice. And the medallions, medallions means that, you know, you, if you register with a taxi company, you're given, you know, all the medallion, which is the, you, you are officially a driver for that, for that brand. They're expensive, but the drivers are underpaid. So you, you don't become rich from driving a taxi. Back then the taxi driver only makes, I think about 6 million Vietnamese dong or 7 million per month. But nowadays, the Uber driver can make, uh, the Grab driver can make 15 million or even some 20 or 30 million Vietnamese dong per month. Not during Corona situation, but back then. So the drivers are considered, it's not a very good occupation. It was quite, um, you know, unrewarding and low paying job. And then medallion costs a lot of money and the drivers in the US make very little. And there's no incentive. There's nothing to encourage the drivers to be responsible to give a good service. Because if you give service, it's that much money. If you don't give good service, it's the same amount of money because it's calculated by the kilometers time, the rate, the fare. So the solution that Uber provides is this. They want to create something that provides good service, that makes it easier for both the driver as well as the customer to have a transaction together. So they want to have a fast and efficient car service that is for us, the people who want to hail a cab. In terms of the market, professionals in American cities uh, and convenience of a cab in New York City where it's very difficult and expensive to find a car cab. The latest consumer web and device technology Automate dispatch and wait, reduce waiting time and optimize fleets and incentive for drivers. So they want to create something that solves all the problem with the taxi business industry. So how it works. First, you have to click. You must be a member to use the service. You have to download the app. Secondly, you don't have to hail from the street. The, there's no medallion licenses. Everybody can be a driver. You need to pay anything. You can guarantee a pickup. You, you don't have to wait in the rain and then pray to God that you will find a car. It's almost guaranteed that you will always find a kit pickup. The difference is one is the one minute click. So it's very fast. Only members can join. You can have an optimized fleet. So, you know, everything is easier GPS based and it's very faster than to call a cab. Before I remember if I want to call a cab, my ling, peng or something, it will probably take me at least 15 minutes before the cab comes. But with Grab or Uber, usually it just takes about, sometimes just one minute, but usually it's five. Luxury automobiles, so you don't have to be in a stinky old car. You can have, you know, a private uh, clean car. And uh, it's great drivers to rate your, uh, your trip. So you can make sure that you are meeting with the good drivers. Um, operating principle, so it's a luxury service on demand. It's modern very efficient, customer focused, blah, blah, blah. The products is um, Uber car apps. It's one click browser. So now they are starting to show the product, the demo. How does it look? How do you press? So this is what it looks like. And then you have use cases, fast local transport, trips to restaurants, things like that. Now they provide the unique value proposition for the user 
which is taps are slow and they're not very responsive. They're not safe. They're not clean. You know, trash talking caps. And Uber is much better than that. So as you can see, Uber has a very long pitch. They really want to sell. But again, remember, Uber was the first unicorn in the world. They raised 1 billion US dollars in their investment rounds. And that's why their pitch is, of course, very impressive. So blah, 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 blah. That's a little bit too much. But I just want to run through so that you can see that there are different types of slides. Ah, so, 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 so here, for example, here, they're looking forward to a location-based service that is 3.5 industry size. Um, this is their quarterly smartphone sales. So if they even have market research, how many people, they consider everybody with a smartphone is somebody who has the capability of becoming an Uber um, user. So here they say, so th remember this slide was done in 2007, which means that it's you know been 14, 15 years has passed since that time. And smartphone sales by operational system, yada, yada, yada. So future optimization is they want to change the, the, their product into this. And this is their going to market strategy, the slide that I told you guys about. It's very, very impressive if you have this. So the, these are different slogans and uh, they have only invites. I still remember when Uber came to Vietnam, uh, I, was, I was dying to have a, um, a invite because I used to drive them, I used to use Uber when I was in other countries, but not in Vietnam. So I actually have to beg my friends, you know, anybody has an invite, send me. So it created that kind of very exciting moment where you feel important, even though, you know, that it was just a marketing tactic for you to get excited about the business, but um, it's worked at that time. And then traction here is up to date, what they have done. Um, they have developed the app, you know, that was 15 years ago. Remember, this is 15 years ago. So the, the business has, you know, it has um, developed a lot. The only funny thing is here, we don't see the slide about the ask money. So we don't see that Uber, how much money is Uber asking for? So probably it was a confidential slide that they sent to the investors only. But as you can see, um, history, was made based on PowerPoint. At a certain point in time, all the big companies, all the businesses started with something like this. And now it's got multi-billion dollar companies and multi-billion dollar businesses. So if you are here, you know, hoping to start your company, remember that it all started somewhere with a pitch, whether you're asking for a bank or from your family member, you are responsible for delivering, explaining, and showing people that your company is worth something. Also remember that this is not only for funding. In my experience, doing a pitch is really helpful for the founder because it helps you clarify all the information that you are supposed to consider. When you open this company, did you know how big your market is? Do you see the potential? Uh, how much money are you gonna burn? Your team, is it strong enough? You should be looking at your company the same way that the investor is looking at your company. And crafting a pitch, even though it might not be read by anyone, if you're bootstrapping and you're using your own money, that's fine too. And I highly recommend that. But having a pitch helps you have a more critical, objective, subjective look at your company. So with that, I have to end our session today because we are out of time. If you have any other questions, drop me a comment. Make sure you see me next week, the same time in the America, please Google um, search on in Facebook, the like US Embassy in Hanoi, and you will find our live videos there going live from 3 p.m. next time. I'll see you later. And this session is also going to be recorded in the video section. So if you missed today, you can go back and watch it. Thank you for being here and thanks for your support. Bye-bye.